Hello, I am Camila Forbes, the Apollo Theater's executive producer. And the Apollo stage is at the Victoria. It's where culture takes shape. So come on, y'all. Let's go check it out. I feel as though Apollo is a heartbeat of Black America. There is the driving of culture happening here on a 365-day basis. Yeah. It is our responsibility as stewards of this 90-year-old institution that we continually move it from a place of reverence to a place of relevance. This is a time of change and opportunity, and it's exciting to feel a part of it. Good afternoon and welcome back to My Harlem Portraits, the show that aims at shedding the light on the fundamental contribution of African Americans to the building of this country and on Black excellence. Today, to represent in the utmost way Black excellence, we have a very ex exceptional guest an esteemed award-winning director and producer for theater and television, and since 2016, the executive producer and a powerful leader at the world-famous Apollo Theater that this year is celebrating its 90th anniversary, Miss Camilla Forbes. <laughs> How are you, Maria? Thank you. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I know you are extremely, extremely busy, and that's a euphemism for you because you are in the midst of changing theaters from the Apollo main stage to the Victoria Theater. So you got a lot on your plate. So I really appreciate you found the time for us. No, it was absolutely a pleasure. I, you know, you are such a beacon in Harlem and particularly in the cultural scene. And it's always, I'm always so excited to see you out at all of the events, et cetera. Um, so it's an honor to, to find the time and carve out the time to sit down and talk. You're going to make me blush. Ah! I can't say things like that. I'm going to, ooh, ooh. <laughs> so let's start from you, from the beginning from you. When and how was your love for theater and music sparked? Yeah. My little theater music was sparked probably when I was younger. Uh, I think my family always, uh, parents always had me in some, surrounded by arts and culture. Um, I took piano lessons very young. Um, I grew up in Chicago, Illinois, right outside of Chicago, Illinois. Um, and we were always going to theater. We were always going to performance. And so I I, I think I was bitten by the bug very early. And then in, in, in high school, I, um, you know, I was a big part of our drama club. I did a lot of plays in high school and then ultimately studied uh, theater uh, when I went to college at Howard University. So it's always been a part of me early on. Um, and I, I knew it was always going to be a part of my future. Um, um, and, and so it's kind of exciting that not only is it a part of my future, but it's not only that, but my career. Absolutely. Your amazing career. And talking about Howard University, where you graduated with a BFA in theater, uh, I feel when you talk, when I hear you uh, talking about it, that those years were particularly special and significant for you in your development as an artist. What is Howard for you? Yeah, I would say Howard is, is really, I think, what has really put me on a path and really defined my career. Um, you know, I think studying arts and culture there um, and, and, and the sense of always having the sense of community, I'm, I'm always looking to recreate that in every job, institution, project that I work on. Um, so, you know, it's, there's, there's no mistake that I'm here at the Apollo at a culturally black institution, um, um, you know, in this role today, because I think all of that stems back to Howard, all of that stems back to like my love for community, my wanting to build community, et cetera. Yeah, I can feel that every time you talk. And also the the acts that come to the Apollo that you organize and so on, there is very often a connection to Howard. Absolutely, absolutely. I mean, so many, right? Not only, I, I think when I think of some of my board members who who came from Howard, but also the artists. Um, so Howard is 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 always there's always some kind of like interconnectedness um, that um, that we pull from. So I, I you know all roads all for me leads back there. It's your artistic family. Yes, that's, ex that's exactly it. 
You are known for your strong, strong commitment to the development of creative works by, for, and about the hip hop generation. Mm. Are these the projects that you consider the highlights of your career before you became the executive director of the Apollo? I mean, I think um, projects that were the highlight of my career, um, prior to coming here, I curated for a lot of other arts institutions. Um, one of those being the Kennedy Center. I was able to, to produce and direct um, one of the first collaborations with the National Symphony Orchestra and a hip hop artist, which was Nas, yeah. um, on the 25th anniversary of um, Illmatic, um, his premiere album. Uh, I um, Again, that was such a special moment because it was music that I grew up on um, that really brought me back to a place. And it was an opportunity to re-examine that music in a new way, in a new form. And you definitely do re-examine music. Always yeah. In a yeah, new yeah, 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 absolutely. The Apollo has, thanks to you, a program that is so energizing and enthusiastic and also that attracts young people. So it, it, right. it's fantastic. Thank you for doing that. Tell us a little bit more. Any other projects that you think were? Yeah, um, you know, so prior to that, I mean, I think, um, um, you know, prior to that, I was uh, a producer on a series called Deaf Poetry Jam that I thought was really, for me, always very significant, an opportunity to bring poets who were part of, again, my artistic family and community. But, you know, working in television and film, there was an opportunity to broadcast their voices to the world. Um, in a way that it had never been done on that scale before and definitely, you know, through a network like HBO. Um, so that was also exciting and, and significant. Um, and, and I think also, you know, my work working with colleagues like um, an artist, artist family and friends like Dominique Morceau, I think I've been looking at a poster when I got to, you know, direct with her a work called Sunset Baby um, in New York City with the amazing actress, um, Dewanda Wise, John Jelks. Um, we had just an incredible cast. And um, um, and again, it was um it was significant because you know, we did the play in a small little theater downtown. And um and and it was just the purity of storytelling. Um, you know, there was no noise around us that it, you know, commercial theater or whatever that the noise brings. It was just how to be we true and how do we tell the story in the best way possible. In what years was that? Because I just saw it at the... Yeah, so they just remounted it uh, this year. It was 10 years ago. It was in 2013 when the first production happened in New York. You always before your time. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> um, you also did a hip hop festival that was that's right festival. that's right that's right so for as a producer that's how i cut my teeth you know i, I um uh with in partnership with um clyde valentine and danny hawk we started an organization called the hip hop theater festival uh in new and we started doing festivals in new york and then expanded to dc chicago san francisco we did festivals all across the country um and it was really about giving voice to theater artists that really saw themselves at the intersection right it was um the intersection of um, being from the hip hop generation, but also creating theater under this moniker. Um, and so that was an exciting time. Um, the organization has since been renamed High Arts that's led by a wonderful leader here in East Harlem, Aaron McKinney. Um, and he has really also continued to take that organization to new heights um, in, its, in, in its home in East Harlem. So um, again, super significant because that was a real opportunity, not just of, of not producing work, but also building institution, right? Like building an organization, which is a different kind of a muscle. Um, it takes a different kind of a muscle and gaze. Absolutely. And also many uh, very famous hip hop artists now were launched and supported by your festival. Yeah, yeah. Name a couple of them because I have them in front of me. Oh, wait, Ooh, what names do you have in front of you? I have uh, Obie Award winner, Will Power. Tony oh, Tony yes, winner, that's right. Tara Jones. Tara <laughs> Jones, Will Power, um, Mark Bamuti Joseph. Um, there were so many artists. Um, I think about Chris Diaz, who just wrote the book to Hell's Kitchen, which is Alicia Keys' new musical. Um, you know, there's been so many artists that, that came through. And at that point, we were really just building community. You know, it was, these were people in our community that were like, you know, 
I want to get my play produced. I want to, you know, um, how, how, how can that happen? Um, and so, you know, we were trying to figure out how to produce it, how to support um, these artists, not only here nationally, but across the country. And in some cases, internationally, we presented international artists like John Z. D. from the UK, um, like Frankie Jada from Brazil. Um, and, you know, um, and it, it, again, it was all, all, always it sits at the core is how do we, we use art to build community. Um, so um, that was just another opportunity where that happened. That's what you do. That's right. I'm curious to know, how did the Apollo happen? For me? Yes. So I used to curate for the Apollo. I was hired by Laura Greer um, to as a consultant to do a couple festivals. One was called the Breaking Convention Festival. The other was the Women of the World Festival. Where I was one of the curators on those festivals. So I had been engaging with the Apollo. And um, and then the job became open at that point. And Mickey Shepard held, held this post um, and had really done some incredible infrastructure building here. Um, as the Apollo was really looking towards his gaze as a nonprofit organization. Um, and um, I got a call to start to interview and um, it was a uh, exciting and terrifying all at the same time. <laughs> I never thought on myself, like it's the Apollo. Um, I was like, yeah, they're not going to want me, but I'm happy to be in the mix. Mm -hmm. um, but, um, you know, when I, when, when I got the offer, it was really, I was really awestruck because, um, you know, this organization held such weight and there's such a responsibility um, to be, you know, to touch um, the work that we do here. And, um, and so I, I have to say, you know, I, 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 that, that weight and responsibility has never gone away. I, I, I feel it every day. Yeah. Well, it is, I understand totally. It's a big responsibility because the world knows the Apollo Theater. Right. Everywhere you go, when you mention the Apollo, people know about the Apollo Theater, even if they don't know anything else. But That's when you right. say Harlem, oh, the Apollo Theater. That's right. It's, it's. That's right. That's but right. you are really doing it in a very extremely incredible way. So. And I think it's our responsibility, right? Like there's people know history and legacy of who um, we were as an institution. And and now we're in a new era, a different era. Um, and it's our responsibility to continue that forward, but also define it for now. Um, yeah. and, 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 it, and it's an exciting moment to do that. You are a forerunner. <laughs> Which are the projects that you produced and directed during your career at the Apollo that uh, you're more, most attached to, more proud of, and how difficult or easy was it to realize them? So one of the early projects um, in 2018, we produced an opera in collaboration with Opera Philadelphia called We Shall Not Be Moved. Um, and operas are beasts unto itself. I had never really been on the inside of a project, opera project before. Um, you, number one, it's it's they're quite expensive to produce, yeah. um, and the cost structure was quite expensive in that respect. Um, but number two, also, you know, the time length, right? Like opera singers really book out their years, seasons and seasons and seasons in advance. So, you know, we're even talking about another future project with that partner that is uh twenty twenty seven. So oh it really is a long haul of planning, of fundraising, of not only casting, but also going out to funders um, and, um, and, and supporters to galvanize support. So that was really unique, but also it's an opera at the Apollo. You know, one of the other challenges was how do we, how do we interpret that, right? We are known as very much a popular music venue, um, but quite frankly, opera and the classical voice has always been a part of black history and black culture. And also, Classical voice at the Apollo is nothing new as well, right? As we start to really look in our archives and in our history. And so, you know, it was an interesting challenge um, and particularly with our marketing team and communications around how do we tell that story? Um, so that was really, a, you know, a kind of exciting find for that project. One of the other projects that I've just being really attached to is a project that I produced and directed here. Um, and, and so the opera was one we produced, um, but this was one that I directed. So I had a lot more you know, sort of, you know, hand on, which was work called Between the World and Me, which was an adaptation of Ta-Nehisi Coates' book, ta Coates' book um, for the stage. And just always had this concept of what couldn't a truly like elevated staged event look like. 
um, an opportunity to bring a myriad of voices together, a myriad of actors, activists, community leaders, um, to read excerpts um, that were beautifully staged um, with projections, but also with an, an incredible score. And our score was um, was built by Jason Moran. Um, um, we did that work in Washington, in New York City at the Apollo. We did it in Washington, D.C. at the Kennedy Center, and also in Atlanta at the Atlanta Symphony Orchestra, at the Atlanta Symphony. Um, and it was a powerful moment because for me, it was um, wasn't just about the performance, but it was about where does performance and social impact and responsibility really intersect? Intersect um, because obviously that work is about the reflection of of um, point. And Tanahasi wrote this book to his son in the age of Trayvon Martin, um, and you know as we are in this world of where police killings were happening just consistently um, and now very publicly. Um, where's our where's our response? Where's our community response? So this was one of them. The third piece that I would highlight was a piece called The Gathering. Um, this was a piece that we produced at the Apollo that was directed by MBT's um, Jonathan McCrory. We oh. did it in partnership with MBT. Um, and this was post-COVID, post all of the racial upheaval around George Floyd. Yes. Um, and again, similar to Between the World and Me, where's our community intersection and how are we using art to heal? Um, the gathering was that response. Um, we worked with ACO, which was American Composers Orchestra, as well as commissioned many different artistic um, partners, uh, folks like Toshi Reagan, Jason Michael Webb, as well as Nona Hendricks, um, to create works in response to this moment of, of healing and of this prompt around building a ring shout. Um, there were other pieces that were part of the evening, folks like um, Carlos Simon. Um, um, but, you know, it was really about how do we heal collectively as a community from this moment? Um, it was a powerful work. Um, super excited to say that that particular work is also going to the Kennedy Center later this spring um, and will be presented by the Kennedy Center or, or presented at the Kennedy Center in Washington, D.C. So there's an opportunity to continue the conversation of community healing, not just in our local community, but also our national. And we need it because nothing has changed. That's right. That's I exactly thought, right. I thought that uh, uh, what happened with George Floyd would have the spark that he launched around the world of uh in the indignation and protest would continue but it's not the same at the at that time everybody was free wasn't doing anything we're watching the tv everybody was attentive to what was happening now we are distracted again and we need and that's one of the reasons why i do this show because right. i want people to know what happens that's in, right in this country it's that's right that's very right important so that's that right. project was amazing and there was another one what about the broader world premiere of hippies trip soul train oh yeah that was a fun one yeah Tell me about that um so that's a collaboration um soul train was um uh, written by dominique morceau the choreographer is camille a brown um, and uh, music um, arrangements um, in our, uh, um, and direction um, by Kenny Seymour. Um, and again, it's the story of Soul Train. It's a story of one of our most popular music brands in this country. Um, and, um, you know, Kenny Seymour, uh, you know, and, and we did that work. We workshopped it here in New York City. It had a really successful run out in San Francisco at the American, at ACT Theater. Mm -hmm. um, and we're excited for to bring it back to New York sometime next season. Good, because I didn't see that. I wanna see that. So oh yeah, you'll you'll have time to see it for sure. And you made this story with this first production because it was the first to have black female artists as the creative core of the Broadway musical. The show is also written by, as you said, Dominique Morisot, who my love. And uh, the choreography is the same choreographer who is doing now uh, Hell's Kitchen. And she's That's right. amazing. So it, it, it's fantastic. It really is. And I, yeah, exactly. So when it comes back to New York and Broadway, it will, I, I think it is, um, you know, definitely, you know, a, a, a history making moment for sure. Yeah, it's going to explode. I'm very sure. 
So let's go to the um, last thing for you. You, last two things. You have had numerous awards um, for both directing and producing, including the 2019 MBTF Larry oh, yeah. Theater yeah. Festival, yeah. Leon Hamilton Producer Award, a Ruth Hundred Award, NAACP Image Award, Helen Hayes and Barrymore Award, and an Adelco Award. How does it feel to be so highly recognized among your peers? Um, yeah, I mean, it's. I think it's always great, right? I think awards are always those moments that remind you to keep going, um, or, or just a moment, I think, to pause and recognize of the work that you've done. Um, you know, um, uh, but for me, it's always, I find that my biggest joy is doing the work. Um, my biggest joy is in the rehearsal room. My biggest joy is planning out a season with our team. Um, those are kind of my biggest joys that really um, push me forward. Um, and so, yeah, I I, uh, I am excited um, by the work itself, um, although awards are nice, um, but my reward for sure is always in the work. I understand that. Yeah. <laughs> Last thing, 2021, President yes. Joe Biden named you as a nominee and then inducted you into the National Council of the Arts. Tell me about that. That's an interesting yeah. I think it's an honor for me to be able to um, serve, um, you know, on the on, on the National Council for the Arts, uh, simply because it is about serving. Um, you know, I believe in what we do here. I believe in what we do in our industry, but I also believe that um, it is important that along with the practice, there's advocacy. Um, and so, you know, how I can, we all play our part, not only on the ground, but also in myriad of ways. And this is a very small part that I play, but uh, I think an important one around the advocacy of the arts in our community, in our culture, and, and quite frankly, of how the arts, you know, contribute to healthy societies. Um, that's, a, that's a very important one. Um, and I think, and, and the significance of the arts, not just as an add-on, but as crucial and essential. Um, and so, you know, I think the NEA, um, under the leadership of Chair Maria Jackson is doing some incredible work um, around that. Um, and so, um, you know, um, what, what, and whichever way I can serve, I am um, always here of service for sure. That's one of the things I really love about you. Yeah, it yeah. Comes out very strongly that you feel that. So let's come to the Apollo now. On January 26, 2024, the Apollo turned 90 years old. Yes. And on March 7th, you celebrated its 90th year history, officially opening the Apollo stages at the Victoria Theater, which is the first physical expansion in the institution's history. And you had the special ceremony, and one of the theater was named after former president, John L. Prokop. Tell us how it feels, how it felt, and the significance of this expansion. It was a wonderful ceremony, by the way. I was so honored to be part of it too. Mm, thank you so much for being there. I mean, I think, you know, it's an inflection point, right? And part of the biggest inflection point is that, you know, we are opening these new theaters, but also what's the significance? What is the world that we're sitting in? A big part of the world is that there's a, there's a cultural renaissance and revolution that's happening on 125th Street once again. With the re revitalization or the renovation, I should say, of Studio Museum, the new building of MBT coming on board, the Urban League um, re-estate establishing their post here in Harlem. You've got Harlem State. We've got Caribbean Cultural Center. We've got, um, who am I forgetting, the Schomburg, yeah. um, all right here in our backyard, um, you know, that... Uh, and 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 we're and it's happening at a moment a hundred years from the Harlem Renaissance. This is our new Renaissance, and yeah. I think expansion of all of our buildings is speaking to that. Um, so I think the moment to celebrate and recognize was just that moment of recognition was just that a moment to recognize the significance of we are sitting in a moment that is not only honoring the past but looking forward to the future and 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 recognition of what's happening in the present um, and and the impact of that, you know, what we are doing, you know, will make significant impact, not only here nat locally, but nationally as it had done a century ago. And it, I think it was just, an, it was an important and significant moment. Um, and the ribbon cutting really underscored that for sure. And internationally. 
Correct. Exactly. And internationally. Exactly. You have underlined uh, specific aims for that. Celebrate artistic adventures, providing space for the development of new work and risk-taking, as well as make a greater commitment to the Harlem community, opening additional space for local artists, rehearsal and performances. Can you expand on that? This is very important. Um, I think it's, it is a space that we wanna make accessible, right? Um, that, you know, when I think about spaces, we are, we are not owners of spaces, we are stewards of spaces. And so in that respect, you know, we are looking at our programming as an opportunity of well, who are our partners in this space? How can we reach out? Um, not only reach out, but how, how do we make sure that it is, that it is, um, you know, definitely a space under which many artists, artist collectives, organizations, art organizations that we are in collaboration with, um, you know, there's something's really special about a, a, a more intimate space is that you can actually do more. Um, sometimes with 1600 fixed seating, it becomes limiting in regards to what you can do, who you can produce and how you can produce. But with this space here, it opens up a floodgate. Um, and so we're excited for that because it opens up a floodgate of conversations and activations um, that we're excited to push forward on. And another thing that I think is really important in what you're saying is that your inaugural past and future event of this season, uh, they have tickets priced at $20 or less. Yeah, that's right. That's right. right. And I have to give all credit to our um to our most recent outgoing CMO, Fatima Jones. It was a really big vision of hers around how do we make uh, our programming completely accessible. Mm -hmm. um, so with the help of one of our funders, Sherman Fairchild, we were able to offer this ticket, um, a $20 ticket program under which, um, you know, tickets at the theater were ultimately subsidized so that audiences, there would not be a huge barrier to entrance um, uh, and specifically in the opening season. And tell me about some of the shows that have already started there, which I saw, and they are wonderful. Yeah. Paris and the Renaissance tapes. So the shows that have started this season have really been a part of a commission commissioning process. Um, we opened with the Renaissance mixtape, which was by a Brooklyn collective called Soul Science Lab. We commissioned them about five years ago to create a piece saying, you know, using the theme of the Renaissance. Um, and, um, you know, they took it a step further about, well, what if, what if the Renaissance was now? What if... Uh, WB Du Bois had a Twitter account. What would it sound like? <laughs> they use that as a real launch pad to create an evening of storytelling and music to really explore themes that were happening in the Renaissance then and how there's relation point to now. Um, so Soul Science Lab um, happened, um, was one of the first productions in our in our space. And then obviously Stefan Harris, Stefan Harris, who's a brilliant musician, um, just uh, honestly one of the leading voices in jazz um, as a vibraphonist. But, you know, his dream and in interest was around this idea of AI and jazz mm -hmm. and how can technology move like him improvisationally um, from the um, video uh, to music technology. So he developed this AI kind of response system that played improvisationally like him in the band that they had to follow. Exciting moment. So, you know, when I think about our new space, it is a moment of new works. It's a moment of innovation. It's a moment of exploration and instigation. And um, and I think that full season really speaks to that. Upcoming this April, we have two works um, really focusing in on dance, which is one is uh, Diane McIntyre, Mm -hmm. uh, Diane McIntyre will be um, uh, premiering a new work um, and it's exciting because you know she got her start here on 125th street her company was based here in Harlem so it's kind of a full circle moment for her to premiere new work right on 125th street in Harlem um, along with a media installation by Talvin Wilkes and his collaboration media um, or his collaboration with a media artist La Jeune, Um, and they're looking at um, the artist Snake Hips. Um, it's um, and looking in our Snake Hips was a dance a dancer that performed at the Apollo or really was a well known performer in the 30s and 40s. Um, and looking at Snake Hips then and now, um, looking at some contemporary dancers and Snake Hips and his legacy and how that kind of traverses through time. So it's exciting that this is definitely a then and now kind of exploration that is uh, that we are in the midst of at this point. 
And that's exactly also because, for example, I never heard of that. Mm. See? So there it is. And, yes. And that's what you do at the Apollo. That's the point. That's the point. And I mean, I read a lot about these things and I never heard about that. Yeah. So this yeah. is very, very important. Uh, you are teaching, you are exploring, and you are um, spreading the knowledge of the excellence That's that right. you are performing and you are producing there. Thank you. So if you want uh, one last uh, uh, wish from you, because mm. we are running out of time and you are running out of time. Well, I would say, I mean, one uh, one last wish is that the, the, the future for the Apollo is bright and also the future for Harlem is bright. Um, we live in a rich ecosystem of a community here um, that we are proud to be a part of. And, um, and the ecosystem only gets richer day by day. Um, so, um, you know, I'm excited for what's to come. I'm excited for the moment that we're sitting in and I'm excited to be in partnership with, um, amazing journalists and, um, uh, keepers of cultural records like you, Maria. So thank you. <laughs> I love what I do. It's, it's my passion. You can tell, you can tell it's clear. Passion because Harlem embraced me and welcomed me like a family that I feel more at home here than I feel in Italy. Mm. So that's a lot. Yeah. So I had right. to get back somehow and I found, well, this might be the way to get back. Amazing. It's amazing work you're doing. So thank you. I love that. it. Thank you so much for your words because yes, this really, it's a satisfaction to hear that. Yeah. Thank you, Maria. So well, I can't wait to see you at the theater coming up soon. Any point. <laughs> Oh, oh, yes. Oh, yes. I'm definitely coming to the theater. And uh, uh, I am going to thank you for your time again. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I thank my viewers for being with us. The next time we'll see each other is 12.30 on Saturday, every Saturday, 12.30 on Spectrum News 1993, MNN HD. And if you want to watch the past episode, go to My Harlem Portraits, my YouTube channel, and you can see everything we've done until now. Thank you so much, Miss Maria. Thank you, you, Maria. Thank you, you are so much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Yay, I'm so glad we did this. Yes, I am so happy. <laughs> I couldn't wait anymore. I am so happy. I, I couldn't sleep last night because- Oh was, my gosh. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it was good. Thank you again, Camila. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Maria. Thank you.